just in case. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think I think we're recording. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll get started then. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Thon Bovis. Uh, I've, I've probably met some of you before, but uh, for those of you that have not met me before, I am a professor at Arkansas State University. Uh, I've been here for about 10 years now. This is my 11th. Um, and my lab does all sorts of research on birds, um, everything from genomics to habitat conservation to behavior to parasites. Um, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that that has been going on in my lab now for almost eight years. Uh, we've been studying loggerhead shrikes in the uh, in the in the counties around uh, Jonesboro in, in Craighead and, and Poinsett counties. And it's really been a a lab, a holistic lab uh, activity where everyone in the lab, there are a couple of grad students that typically lead it but all of the lab engages in the research. So, so everything from uh, graduate students to undergrads have, have been part of this research. And you can see a long list of names here that I, that I have listed. Those are all grad students that have come through my lab as well as, um, actually I think these are all grad students, but, but undergrads and other students have also worked on this as well. And so I'm gonna give you guys a, a, a wide array of stuff that we've done so far involving shrikes. And so I call it long-term monitoring, but it's it's a variety of research that we've that we've uh, conducted involving shrikes over the past eight years. Let's see if this. Okay. All right. So uh, just a little background. Um, agriculture uh, has changed the landscape of the central United States in in pretty dramatic ways. Um, a large amount of the central U.S. used to be grasslands, uh, prairies, and other types of native grasslands. And over the past 150 years, 120 years, most of those grasslands have been converted to some form of agriculture, um, and a lot of it being row crop agriculture throughout the Great Plains, <laughs> and then into the uh, the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, Probably not coincidental in this uh, in this time. We've also seen a, a real uh, severe decline of, of grassland birds as well. And so we have 80% of the historic grasslands converted and about 74% of the, of the species of grassland birds are in decline. Um, that includes things like Eastern Meadowlark and Hornlark as well. And, you know, the, the hope is that while we, we can recognize that this mass conversion has been pretty detrimental to a lot of bird species that, that use open habitats um, like grasslands, the hope is that while we're not going to revert those systems back to native grasslands, um, we can hopefully do things that will allow us to integrate both the ecology of these regions and the agricultural um, production that is uh, that we, we're trying to accomplish with these regions, with with the uh, the the conversion that we've conducted over the past 120 years, and so rather than just assuming that these that these uh, croplands are going to be biological wastelands, hopefully we can we can find ways to both grow food and maintain productive ecosystems at the same time, and. What we mean by maintaining healthy eco-agricultural systems could include a couple of things. Um, it could certainly include uh, the maintenance and preservation of some maybe key habitat features that, that other organisms can use besides just humans. Um, the hope is that we can also conserve some of the ecosystem services that, that these species provide us and that these ecosystems can provide us. And then um, hopefully we can we can mitigate some of the the uh, the risk of, of toxins both in these ecosystems and then the possibility that these toxins can, can um, move to other ecosystems as well through waterways and um, possibly trophic chains as well. And in the end, what we think of is, is this idea of one health where we have healthy environments, we have healthy people, and then we have healthy animals, all, all of those things being important aspects of, of maintaining a, a healthy environment. So the species that, that we've been studying in these, these pseudo grassland environments are loggerhead shrikes, 
We study some other ones as well, but this is the one we've been studying for the longest. Um, for those of you that are, most of you are probably familiar with the loggerhead shrikes a little bit, but just a little background. They are a grassland associated songbird, a predatory songbird, meaning that they, they eat meat, they eat flesh, um, things like uh, mice and snakes and, um, and lizards, depending on where you are in the range. Uh, and I say grassland associated because they are not what we would consider kind of your classic grassland species that that you'd find in the middle of a prairie where there are no um, where there's no woody vegetation or where there was no woody vegetation. Instead, they're in areas where you have kind of a an open habitat that would allow for them to to forage on the ground uh, from perches. However, so they do need some um, sort of structure to hunt from and then to build their nests in. So they do not nest on the ground, they nest in woody vegetation. And so that could be shrubs or, or, or trees. And so they wouldn't be necessarily associated with the, you know, the historical tall grass prairies where there was no uh, woody vegetation or very little woody vegeta vegetation, but maybe on the edges of those, of those prairies. And then in other habitats where you have kind of a mix of open and then uh, sparse scattered uh, woody vegetation like in deserts. Um, one of the, besides being just a really cool bird that that um, kind of is the mix between a raptor and a songbird, um, we're also really interested in shrikes because they have declined a lot, right? And so we love to watch them and we love to see their all the, the neat things they, they do behaviorally. Um, and those, the ability for us to do that has, has really declined over the past 60 years. Um, across the range, they've shown an annual decline of about 3.5% per year. Um, in the eastern U.S., it's even more extreme, and uh, there are both sedentary and migratory uh, populations of shrikes, and it seems like the migratory populations are declining even faster than the sedentary populations. However, if you look at this, this eBird map that, that, I, that I put up or I uh, um, downloaded just recently, um, you can see that, that all this red is all declines. And so if you look across the range, in the Eastern US, you can see it's it's red, pretty much every little dot you can see is red. There's a few places in the Western US, you can see in the Great Plains, Upper Great Plains, you can see some, a few blues, but even in the West, the majority of the, of the dots are red, which indicates a decline pretty much throughout their range. And it's, it's not entirely known why they are declining the way they are. And there's a variety of hypotheses that, that have been thrown out there to try to explain the decline. And these are a variety of, of, of kind of big picture, ultimate sort of explanations, and then more proximate, smaller scale things. So things like low win overwinter survival, which is a, you know, is a, a pretty big thing that lots of different factors could be influencing. Um, and then at a smaller scale or at a more proximate scale, things like pesticides. Um, habitat loss certainly could be part of this story as well. And then another more reproductive or uh, demographic sort of thing like low reproductive success. All of these things could be related to the decline we've seen. Um, however, we, we still lack a lot of information ab about these birds in order to try to figure out which ones of these are most important and which one of these problems can we can we work on trying to reverse. Um, winter ecology is really understudied, so it's hard to know much about their overwinter survival. Um, and in agricultural regions where these birds are found, really we don't know much about them at all, or we didn't until we, we started studying them eight years ago. And then a, a cr critique of, of research on birds in general and ecological research in general, there's really very few long-term studies of, of any species. Uh, most studies are, are one to two years because that's what the funding dictates. Um, but that's really a shame because we, we, we sometimes lack the ability to, to answer these big, long-term problems um, very effectively because all of our studies are, are relatively short term. So we tried to uh, fix some of these problems by studying these birds in the winter, uh, in agricultural landscapes and for a long time. And this is our, our study area. Uh, sorry for the, the <laughs> misspell there, but we have, we're in the Mississippi uh, Alluvial Valley uh, here in Northeastern Arkansas. Um, and you can see this on a map of the abundance of shrikes, again, from eBird. Um, right here in the red, 
uh, box is where we do our work. And you can see a, a lot of dark blue there, meaning that there are a, a lot of shrikes there. And this area is really <laughs> dominated by agriculture now. And interestingly, historically, this was not probably much of grassland. This was largely um, bottomland forest. And this bottomland forest was removed over the past hundred years as well. And, you know, what it's been turned into is certainly probably better for shrikes than what it was before. However, I will say there is there is definitely debate about how much of this area uh, was strictly bottomland forest versus a little bit more um, open than maybe some people give it credit for. And, and, and we, we definitely know that there were prairie lands within this Mississippi alluvial valley, such as the Grand Prairie in, in eastern Arkansas. And there's other pieces of evidence that suggest that there were possibly other open habitats within this ecosystem, uh, such as glades and, and maybe small prairies or small grasslands that, that could have uh, been occupied by shrikes even before the uh, removal of the bottomland forests and the introduction of row crop agriculture. But in any event, whatever it was before, um, before humans or before Europeans came in and, and removed most of these trees, we now know that this, this area is mostly dominated by row crops, row crops um, rice, cotton, soybean, corn. In the middle here, uh, between these areas of agriculture is Crowley's Ridge, which is still forested. And then the gray area there is, is Jonesboro. Um, we don't find shrikes in any of those forested areas, despite the fact that there are pastures on, on Crowley's Ridge. And despite the fact that there are, um, in other areas, lots of urban shrikes. Here, we don't have real urban shrikes. And I don't know why exactly. If you go down to the Gulf Coast, though, you can find incredibly urban shrikes that that live in parking lots and, and places like that. Uh, but here we study them almost exclusively in the, the agriculture areas on either side of Crowley's Ridge. And so this is what that kind of looks like a lot. You see ditches with, with agriculture and then county dirt roads uh, uh, crisscrossing the, the landscape. And then very importantly, utility lines that also are, are cross, crisscrossing the landscape and provide some structure for, for shrikes to hunt from, um, and then occasionally things like fence rows and, and, and scattered trees. So no shrikes in Jonesboro, no shrikes on Crowley's Ridge, but we got shrikes in the agricultural areas surrounding. And, and this is uh, showing uh, Craighead and Poinsett County, which is where we do our, our work. All right, so what have we, what have we done? Um, for the last eight years, we've done a lot, All right? So we started in 2016-17, and that year we, we started our first non-breeding uh, field season. And what we did was we went out and we started catching shrikes and we started marking them with color bands um, and then systematically monitoring them. So going back and looking for them and making sure that they are, are still around, um, seeing how, how long they stick around for, seeing how long they, they live. And we've been monitoring them every year since then. Um, for a couple of winters, we did really intensive observational studies of, of diet uh, and behavior. Uh, we looked at movements and things like home range. And then we also looked at, at how, what sort of habitat features they were selecting. In 2021, we then started adding on a, a second component, which was the breeding season. And so we started looking at, uh, at nests and trying to figure out if there were any issues going on with reproduction. Um, we continued to band and recite uh, shrikes. And then more recently, we've, we've started another line of questioning, and that is related to uh, uh, pesticides, in particular neonicotinoids which are a, a class of, of pesticides which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and we're looking at whether or not they are being affected by these, by these neonics, as they're called, uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. And then we also started a study, which I'll, I'll get to at the end, which, which is, I think, really interesting. And um, have, this is brand new stuff, but this is related to their microbiome. So the, the, the little bacterial species that live inside of the gut of loggerhead shrikes. And so we'll get to that at the end. All right, so um, all of this banding and, and capturing shrikes, and by the way, I'm gonna go back real quick. The way we capture these guys is with this trap right here. This is the main way we catch them. 
It's a little trap that has a couple different ways that the strike can go into. They can walk in from the ground. They can drop in from above. And then there's a little treadle that if they step on, the trap door will shut behind them and above them and they will be captured. And the way we get them to go in there is we also put a little mouse in a separate little trap that um, is not injured by this at all. He just kind of sits there, she, I should say, sits there and is usually completely unaware that the Shrike is even in there. Uh, but, but the Shrike is trying to get to that mouse to eat it. And that is the way that we lure them into the trap. And so all the years of, of capturing these things has, has been really exciting. Um, we love bringing people out and letting them uh, experience our, our, our research. Uh, let them come out and help us trap birds. Let them come out and get to get get a chance to hold the shrike and maybe even bleed with a shrike. Um, they are pretty they are pretty vicious when you have them in your hand, and, and it's kind of fun to to feel some pain as as I'm sure they are not appreciating what we're doing to them either. So we've had you know hundreds of people that have come out with us over the years. Uh, I'd say yeah, pretty close to hundreds uh, that we have gotten to uh, the chance to experience our our research with us. And so I'm going to get into some of the results that we've that, that, that a lot of them I've kind of just put together recently, but I'll let you know some of the stuff that we've found so far. Um, and so I'll start out by saying our birds in these counties have been doing really well, uh, a lot better than I actually expected. Um, if you look at how what the chance of them surviving an entire winter is, it's calculated at over 95%. It's about 95.5% of the time the individuals survive the winter. And there's some error on either side of that. But in, in general, it's a really high survival rate. And what that means is not only do the birds have to not die over the winter, they also have to not move very far over the winter because we have to recite them to know that they're still alive. And so that tells you a couple of things. It tells you that they're, they're surviving pretty well and they are pretty site faithful to the locations that they are spending the winter in, which, which is pretty surprising in my opinion. I, I didn't expect them to be so site faithful that we'd be able to recite them so much um, that, that we would be able to, uh, if you see a bird early in the winter, most likely you're gonna see it in the same location late in the winter. Very rarely do they disappear. And what I'm calling winter is everything from December to, to February. Um, and so those three months are, are where we've been monitoring them. Um, as I mentioned, it's also the, the case that we're able to detect them really well in the winter. Again, uh, the fact that they stick around in the same areas allows us to detect them pretty well. And because they like to sit on wires, they are relatively easy to, to recite. So it doesn't take that much work to, to find them in the winter. Um, this is different than the breeding season. In the breeding season, they're much less likely to be detected. They will... Um, They'll go into trees and they'll they'll go away from the roadside where the where the wires are, and it makes it a lot harder to find them. We've only been able to detect two morality mortality excuse me mortality events, um, and one of them was we we saw a northern harrier that took out a shrike. It actually wasn't one of our our banded birds, but um, it was a shrike that we were just watching for other purposes. And then another one, which this on the right is a bird that, that we did uh, actually ban. Um, his name was General Ironbeak. And we banded him. Um, and then the next winter, no, I'm sorry, it was later the same winter we banded him. We, we went out looking for him to see if we could find him. And while we were looking for him, um, we happened across some farmers. And the farmers started talking to us about what we were doing. And we, we mentioned what we were doing. And we actually had caught another shrike at that moment. And so we showed them the shrike we had just caught. They're like, oh, hey, well, you know, it's funny. We, has anyone been banding blue jays out here? And we said, no, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. He's like, well, we, we found a dead blue jay. And it kind of looked like that bird. Like, I'm like, are you sure it was a blue jay? They're like, well, actually, now that you mention it, maybe it wasn't a blue jay. And it had bands on it. And so they actually had the carcass of one of our banded birds. And they brought it to us and we uh, were able to identify it as general iron beak. And, and that was one of the, the two mortality events that we've been able to, to detect from our birds. All right, so now this graph I've just made recently, and this is some information um, related to not just surviving through the winter, but being able to survive the entire year round. So from the time we see it to the next year, what is the likelihood that bird is going to be able to survive that entire season? 
And we've calculated this in a couple of different ways. And we've split it up by different categories as to whether the bird was sedentary, meaning that it never left. It was always in, the, in our region from both winter and breeding season. And then we also show here uh, what we call migratory individuals. And there is a little caveat to what we call migratory individuals, because as of right now, the only way we can identify a bird as migratory is if we do not see them the following season. So if we found a bird in the winter, um, if we call it migratory, it means that we didn't see it during the breeding season. If we caught a bird and saw it during the breeding season, we call it migratory if we didn't see it in the, the following winter. But if we find it again the next breeding season, we know that it survived. And the same thing for if we find it in the next wintering season. And so what you see here are some estimates of, of survival or the likelihood that a bird's gonna survive an entire year from birds that we captured in the winter and monitored first in the winter versus birds that we first captured and monitored in the breeding season. And what we find is that for the birds that we think are sedentary, we have really high annual survival, meaning that they are able to make it an entire year. About 60 to 70% of our sedentary birds make it back uh, the next year. For the migratory birds, the number, as you can see, is much, much lower. It's between 15 and 20%. And then we have a bunch of birds that, that are unknown that we, that we didn't monitor early on in, in, our, in, our, uh, in our work year round. And so we've just kind of thrown them in as unknown at this point. And overall, you get about 50% survival across all of these different um, categories. And, and the caveat I'm going to make here is that the only way we could identify at this point, birds as sedentary, is that we see them during one winter and one breeding season. And the problem with that is that there's a little bit of a bias there in that it could be that those migratory birds um, that we're calling migrant or, or birds that we are calling sedentary died somewhere between the first time we saw them and that next season. And then we just put them into migratory status, which automatically makes that migratory status a little bit less likely to survive just because of the way that we're categorizing them. But at this point, we have no other way of really distinguishing sedentary birds from migratory birds. And so that brings us to a question, <clears throat> assuming that that data is at least somewhat correct, it brings us to the question of when we don't find a bird um, after the first season we banned it or after some season, does that really mean that they have low annual survival? Or could it be that those migratory individuals are just more likely to disperse to different regions, given the fact that they are maybe migratory, and so they might just be moving around a lot more, and the likelihood they're going to come back to the same spot is pretty low, right? And so this is a, a big problem in any sort of study that uses a bird that relies on, on reciting to determine whether they died or not. You can never distinguish death from long distance dispersal. You'll never know if a bird came back or, or didn't come back because they're dead or didn't come back because they, they just moved on to another location. And this is, a, this is a big issue that we don't really have an answer for until we have some way of tracking these birds without having to recapture them. And right now there's just no technology that's small enough that allows you to track this small of a bird uh, without recapturing it to, to get the data back. And if you have to recapture it, then it kind of defeats the purpose because you're going to have to have the bird come back to recapture it. So we, we still have to think of ways to try to, to solve that or hope for, for better technology. Um, so other, some, other, some other neat data that we've collected from the years of resetting these birds has to do with uh, their movements. And so I talked about this long distance dispersal, birds moving so far away that we never see them again. And we think they're dead, but maybe they're not. Uh, but instead, this is now short distance dispersal meaning that they have moved somewhere within the, the area that we are conducting our study. So those two counties, which is a pretty big area, but it's not as big, obviously, as the area where the birds could move to. And so I'll, I'll let you know that of, the, of all the birds that we have banded over the time, uh, over the years, 38% of them uh, were recited in a season other than the one that they were captured in, right? And so that's 68% of the birds that we've, that, so our 68 birds that we have captured have been recited at, in some other season. We've had birds that have been over seven years old. We have right now several that are at least seven years old. Um, and we've had a, a bunch that are at least six years old as well. 
And then movements between seasons are pretty interesting. We, most of them are, are reset and really close to where we originally banded them, less than 500 meters away. But every once in a while, we find birds accidentally, um, or I guess incidentally, pretty far from where we banded them. And so here are some, some of the cases of long distance, long short distance dispersal that we've, that we've found. Uh, we had a couple of birds between winter and breeding that moved over nine kilometers. One moved 9.2, one moved 18.2. We had a bird that, that between two breeding seasons moved 11.2 kilometers. And then we had one bird, our longest distance, documented distance movement between two seasons was between two winters, uh, it moved 28.5 kilometers. And that's what's shown in this map here. Um, she was she was captured down here southwest of Jonesboro, and then she moved all the way across into a uh, pass on the other side of Crowley's Ridge, past Jonesboro, and then we recited her 28.5 kilometers to the northeast uh, in the following winter. And so a long distance movement that we uh, were able to document, which again is really unusual. Note there's not any data on that at all. All right, moving on to some of the other data we've collected. Um, this is now behavioral data that we've been collecting over the years. And I'll start out by showing some of the data that we've collected from uh, really intensive observational uh, surveys of these birds, where we would watch them for 30 minutes straight, and we would see how they're using the environment around them. And what we found is that, you know, one of the questions has always been, when you see shrikes sitting on wires, are you seeing them sitting on wires just because it's easier to see them sitting on wires? And really, there's a whole bunch of them that are, you know, hiding out in trees or in shrubs, and you're just, you're just seeing the ones that are on wires. From this study where we're watching these birds for 30 minutes straight, we can pretty much say pretty definitively that they really do like the wires. So it is not just that it's easier to see the birds on the wires. Shrikes really like using wires to perch from. It turns out that wires are, are kind of at the right height for being high enough to get a decent view of your surroundings, but not being too high where you can't see movement on the ground if you're going after a little cricket or after a mouse. Right? And so it's almost at like the, the wires just accidentally have been put up at almost the ideal height for where they would want to hunt from. And so the birds really do like using wires for hunting purposes. And then we also studied their, their foraging behavior during the winter. So they would sit on these wires and then we would watch what they did and how many things they caught and how successful they were in catching them and where exactly they were foraging for their prey. And so this is, again, is the classic uh, landscape that we that we do our work in. Um, oftentimes the birds will be sitting on the wire and we're watching them and seeing what they do. And, and here's what we found. So we found that they did a lot of their hunting in the right of way grasses that are on either side of utility wires and oftentimes on either side of these ditches. So a lot of a, a lot of attempts in these areas and they were really successful, like 60 percent of the time they go down for something in these grasses, they were successfully catching them. They do use the ag fields as well, um, not quite as often, and actually a little less successful than the right away grasses, but they were also using the ag fields. The ditches, they didn't use quite as often, um, but they would go down and get things in the ditches. They had, a, they had about equal success rate in the ditches. And then the roads, they didn't go down as often, but when they did go down to the roads, they were incredibly successful. And of course, you know, things out in the roads are really obvious. And so you, you might not be surprised that they that they would catch things in the roads really well. And then they also actually go things after they did some fly catching and went after things in the air. Um, they would they would even capture little ballooning spiders that were flying by on on, on webs or on silk strings. And so they, they would be fly catching in some cases as well. And so these birds were using pretty much all of the environment around them to to forage in. And the next thing we did is we then uh, watched to try to identify what it is that they were capturing. And we did this in a couple of different ways. We, we watched them and actually looked at what was in their mouth when they came up from the ground. Um, and then we also went around and looked for their, their caches or otherwise known as their larders um, and identified what was in their larders that they would be uh, leaving behind as, as, they, as they were going about their foraging. And what we found is that these two methods gave you really different uh, views of what these birds were eating or, or capturing at least. When you watch them on the left here, almost all the time they were capturing insects. All, even in the dead of the winter, the insects were by far the number one um, prey item. And if you add this all up, insects come out to be about, I think, 80%, something like that. 
Um, occasionally, we saw them catch uh, birds. Occasionally, we saw them catch um, some some mice and some some rodents. And then a, a pretty decent amount of time, we saw them catch frogs as well, which are these anurans right here. So frogs by far were the, the number one vertebrate, but invertebrates by far were, were more common. However, if you look at the larders, you would have a different picture. In the larders, most of the time what you find are frogs. And so that might just be reflective of the fact that it's easier to find the larger things in the larders as well. But it also, I think it's reflective of the fact that a, a little insect, they can just swallow really quickly. Whereas a frog takes a little more work or um, a bird takes a little more work. We did still see a decent number of, of grasshoppers and a variety of other insects as well, but frogs made up the majority of the larders. And if you do some statistical analysis, what you find out is these are really statistically different. And so if you wanted to study uh, what shrikes eat or what shrikes capture, you probably want to do both of these things, both the observation and going around and looking for larders. Otherwise you might not get the full picture of, of what it is that, that shrikes are using. And so now I'm gonna just show you some really fun pictures, <laughs> somewhat gruesome, but also fun of some of the larders that we have found over the years. Um, and so you can see some of these things, everything from, from spiders to, to hemipterans, to crickets, to grasshoppers. And you can see the substrates that they impale them on are, are everything as well. Everything from barbed wire to, uh, this is looking through a, a a scope or, or, or might be a telephoto lens up at a wire, um, a utility wire, and they've impaled a spider up there. Um, they also use natural sub thorns like, like uh, honey locust trees. And sometimes they'll just jam them onto just kind of spiky points that are left from cotton stubble. So they use whatever they can possibly find to impale these prey uh, when, they, when they decide to uh, uh, cache their food. Um, here are some of the vertebrates. Lots and lots of frogs. Um, you get some really gruesome ones that are almost, you know, pretty symmetrical where you can see this green frog where they have kind of shoved the stick right through their mouth, which was pretty amazing. Green frogs, um, snakes, small mammals, skinks. So it runs the gamut of, of pretty much everything you could find out there. They are truly generalist um, predators. Uh, here's a few other things. This one's pretty amazing. This was a, this was a, a robin that we were watching them eat. We did not see them actually capture it, um, and it's possible that they were scavenging, but it's really unlikely. There's not a lot of evidence that they do much scavenging. Um, so it was more likely that they, they probably captured this robin um, and, and killed it. It was probably not doing very well to begin with, but but we did want, get to watch and eat it. Earthworms, crayfish, so so again, like all sorts of, of, of different animals. I'm going to show you one little video. This is kind of a fun one. This is a video I took of a, of a shrike that had captured a garter snake. The garter snake was still a little bit alive, but I'm going to just show you the size of this snake is pretty impressive. And so this is through a, uh, this is again, a telephoto lens. So it's a little shaky and far off, but, but I'll let you watch a little bit. And I'm going to fast forward it to the end so you can see it carry it away. And so you can see it, excuse me, you can see it biting at the snake. The snake is still alive at this point, but it's not doing very well. And it's, and it's biting right below its head. And so it goes on like this for a while. I'm going to, I'll fast forward here to, the end of this. <laughs> oh, here we go. So it goes on for a while. And then here, I slow it down to watch it. So here's it in slow motion now. As it flies away, you can see the length of that snake. <laughs> so it carries that thing away. Uh, and it carried about 50 meters away. And then it found a, a, a stick on the ground that was dead. And it impaled the, the snake on that stick. And the snake was still alive, actually. I mean, or at least it was showing some movement still. I guess I don't know if you can consider it alive at that point, but you can see what the what the shrike had done at that point. So pretty amazing birds, the things that they can take down despite their their relatively small size.
And we also, um, one of the things we did also while we were while we were recording all the things that we uh, found Shrake's eating, uh, we decided to to start up a, an iNaturalist project that we call the Larder Locker. Um, and if you go on to iNaturalist, if anyone does iNaturalist and they ever find any Shrake larders, you can go on there and you can, and anyone can can upload their their observations. Um, and this has become actually pretty popular. Uh, people from across the U the U.S. and Mexico have put entries into this project. And I think it's up to like 144 species that people have uh, entered as, as cached uh, prey items from loggerhead shrike. So it's pretty cool. So you get everything from crabs down in Southern Texas um, to lizards in the, in the, the, the Great Plains to uh, big insects out west, I'm not even sure what that is, a Dobson fly or something, uh, but but it's a pretty amazing. And I'm gonna point out two of my favorite observations. One of them we made, um, and then one of them that was just posted just the other day. Uh, so it turns out that I said shrikes don't really scavenge much. Um, it turns out they do a little bit, right? And, and this first one on the left is, is a piece of bacon that we actually watched a shrike pick up carry to a, a crepe myrtle, this is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and then wrap the bacon around the branch and fly away. Um, and so, so this, this was a, a, a pretty unexpected behavior that we noticed. And we thought, ah, well, you know, how often could that possibly happen? It's probably pretty rare. This is actually right in Baton Rouge. This is the best Western motel or hotel right behind it. Um, then just the other day, someone from Birmingham, Alabama uh, posted this. This is a, a the, the leftover piece of a chicken wing from Popeye's um, right next to the, the fast food restaurant. And, and she said, this is a woman named uh, Michelle um, Reynolds who posts, she really likes strikes and she, she, she submits things all the time on, on our iNaturalist project. And she said it's the fourth piece of chicken she's found impaled at this location. <laughs> And she said, there, and this in this one, she said there's a nesting pair with two fledglings um, right by there also. So uh, apparently they're learning at least, maybe they're learning how to how to take advantage of of some human environments. Um, and I will say, in this, in the as you get farther south, shrikes become much more urban. And there's, I don't know why we never see shrikes in urban areas in in Jonesboro or as far as I know in Arkansas. Really, there's not many what what we would call urban shrikes that are eating fast food. Um, but as you get further south and along the coast, there's a lot of real urban shrikes, and it's unclear if these things are really different, if they're if there's if there's something biologically different about them, or if they've learned somehow uh, to be able to to live with humans more. It's it's still a mystery at, at this point. But I, I want to look at this a little bit farther because I think there's something interesting going on there. All right, a couple of other things that I want to show you. Um, this is some of our reciting of, of birds during the winter and, and kind of the spatial extent that they, that they use during the winter. On average, they use about 13.4 hectares. Um, and so turning that into acres, uh, multiply by 2.5. So it's like, uh, um, what does that come out to be? Uh, 30 some acres, something like that. And so they don't really use huge areas. They they pretty much stick around relatively small areas, which makes it easy to recite them. You can see they, they spend most of their time right along the roads, which is where the wires are. Um, a lot of them had really small, what, what we're calling home ranges. Now, they probably, this is, this is certainly a minimum. They, they certainly could use, they probably do use more area than, than we recognize, but with our observations, it still was a relatively small area that they, they used. And, and um, the fact that we're able to find them so easily every time we go back also speaks to the fact that they probably don't use that much of an area. And this is in these ag areas, which we wouldn't think of as being you know, full of food, but apparently there's enough for the ones that are out there. All right, so moving on now to uh, some other stuff that we've done. And so this is a study of, of habitat selection to see what sort of habitat variables were most important for these birds and were selected for, um, which things they preferred and which things they avoided. And to do this, I'm not gonna go a lot of detail, but we compared what the birds used to what was available to them in some area around them. And we were trying to look for those habitat features that they used more often than we would expect by given random chance, given what was available to them. And so this is what we found. Here's a, here's a couple of things, and this is across all strikes. And so a couple of things that we found, and first of all, we did this at different scales. So the first scale we did this at was at 500 meters. So at 500 meters around the bird, what things are they using versus what things are available? And 
you know, I said that our birds are not urban, but it turns out that if you look at things like small little houses and yards and areas that, that humans do have uh, some impact on, we're calling that urban here. Uh, we're not talking like city urban, but we are talking about like urban in rural landscapes. So a house that is surrounded by ag fields, you'll often find the shrikes near the house, right? And so it turns out that they do like areas that are somewhat urban compared to what is available. And so if, you, if, you, if you're driving through um, Poinsett County or Craighead County through the ag fields and you see a single house, oftentimes you're gonna find a shrike there. Right? And so they are they are attracted to those areas for some reason. Now, it could be related to food. It could be related to the fact that that maybe they're going to stick around and breed there. And that's the only place where there's a tree in, in some area. Uh, we're not entirely sure, but they do seem to be attracted and, and prefer those little pockets of, of humanity or at least things that humans do in those in those areas um, versus areas that are completely just agricultural. At smaller scales, they, they like other things. And so if you compare where you find shrikes to where you, to what is available to them, um, oftentimes they're going to be found close to water. And so being close to water seems also to be an important aspect of what they like. Oh, I got to do these little shrike, sorry. Here are these little shrike movements. Shrike likes water, doesn't like no water. And then at really fine scales, they like taller perches, which isn't that surprising. Um, occasionally you'll see them perching out in stubble in fields, but they typically like things that are five meters and higher. And most of the wires out, out in the area that we are working are about seven meters off the ground. So, you know, about a little over 20 feet off the ground. That seems like a really fine height for these for these birds. And I will say, you know, um, if we got rid of all the wires out in these areas, I don't think we would have many shrikes left. Um, those wires are are incredibly important feature for these habit for the habitat uh, that that what it is right now, right? You know, there's talk of burying wires and there's talk of, of, of changing the, the grid system to make it um, more modern. Um, if we do that, uh, hopefully we can also find ways to provide these perches for these species that, that now kind of rely on these things to, to make their living. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this. It's kind of interesting, but I wanna get to the next stuff and I, and I don't wanna keep you guys here all night. Um, so this, this was just looking really quickly at, at differences by sex. And it turns out that the, the, the two sexes do kind of do things a little bit different during the winter. During the winter, most of these shrikes are by themselves. And it seems like the males and females have differing strategies for what they are looking for. And that could be due to the fact the males are going to be the ones that eventually are going to be the territory holders during the breeding season. During the winter, we're not entirely sure how territorial they are. But once breeding season comes around, they are going to be territorial. And it could be that the, the males are, are preparing for that period more than the females, where the females will eventually find a male who has a territory. But in the winter, they can be a little more um, willing to just go wherever the food is. All right, so I want to quickly talk about the most recent stuff that we've been doing, and that is related to the pesticides um, and the effects of these pesticides on, on shrikes. And so as you guys are probably aware, um, we the way that we do a lot of the things in, in modern human society involves all sorts of chemicals, uh, everything from fertilizers to uh, pesticides to all sorts of industrial waste and, and runoff that, that can make its way into natural environments. Um, these, these toxins increase as we become more and more modern um, and finding ways to mitigate the effects of these toxins is going to be a real important challenge that we have to meet if we're going to be able to provide an environment that's healthy both for humans and for other wildlife. Um, as these toxins run off of, of agricultural fields or from factories or wherever else, they can work their way into the environment, which eventually then makes its way into organisms at the beginning of the food chain, and then eventually it can work its way up into the higher trophic levels, things like raptors and shrikes being at the, at the, at the higher end of the trophic chain. Um, just real quick history, pesticides have been around for a long time. So these things that we use to try to, to, try to protect our crops from our competitors like insects. Um, DDT is a famous one, of course, uh, that Rachel Carson uh, wrote about in the 1960s. 
Uh, it, it had all sorts of negative effects on high level uh, trophic species, especially raptors by causing eggshell thinning, which caused their eggs to hatch prematurely, which caused these birds to have almost complete reproductive failure. Things like Cooper's hawks and peregrine falcons and, and bald eagles almost disappeared from the entirety of the, of the lower 48 states. Um, since since DDT was, has banned, we've moved over to other types of pesticides. Um, one of them that is the most popular now is a class of pesticides that we call neonics or neonicotinoids. Uh, they were developed in 1991, and they've gone through a variety of changes in our uh, evolutionary arms race that we are in with the, the, the pests that eat our crops. Um, since then, there's been a lot of media and research done on them, uh, in particular related to their effects on, 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 on pollinators. And in 2018, there was actually a partial neonic ban in Europe. Um, and right now, there is a, a serious uh, EPA biological evaluation of neonics to try to figure out how bad they are and how much damage they're doing to our environment. But we still don't exactly know what's going on. Right? And in most cases, it's completely unknown whether or not they are causing problems or are relatively harmless. Um, I already mentioned loggerhead shrikes, but these birds do live in agricultural areas and they also live in non-agricultural areas. And so they, they make a, a pretty good study species to, to try to see what is going on with neonics on a relatively high level trophic um, species. Uh, so far, the, the effects of neonics have, have not been studied too much on, on higher level trophic species. They've been studying a few predatory birds, three raptors, um, but the studies were, were pretty basic and just more or less saying whether or not there were neonics found in the tissues of those raptors. Um, no one's really looked at whether or not it then has an impact on their survival, on their ability to, to raise young and, and so forth. And so what we wanted to do was three things. We wanted to, to test for neonic residues in the blood of, of shrikes. Um, we wanted to look for residues both during the growing season when you would expect the residues to be more likely or the, the neonics to be more likely and during the winter to see if there was any sort of long persistence in the environment. We then wanted to look to see if there was any effect of those neonics on a variety of, of metrics. Um, things like uh, survival, things like reproduction, things like body condition, all of those things. And then finally, we wanted to look to see, and this is, you know, this is brand new and and it, we, it's not completely linked to neonics at this point, but we wanted to see if there was any difference between the gut microbiome, the, the bacteria species that live in the gut of agricultural shrikes versus non-agricultural shrikes. And the reason we want to do this is because there's been some really interesting studies on other systems that suggest that the gut microbiome can help detoxify organisms that live in highly toxic environments. And so if you have the right species of bacteria living inside of you, you may be able to handle pesticides a lot better than individuals that don't have those same gut microbiota. And so if the microbiome can help break down these toxins, that's a pretty amazing feat and, and really interesting information if we can figure that out. All right, so let me show you what we found. Um, first of all, we used two sites, both of them in Arkansas. Uh, we had got birds and tissue blood from non-agricultural non sites in the northwest part of the state. And then we had our agricultural area in northeastern uh, Arkansas. And so we collaborated with some people from, from U of A um, and got blood from both these regions. We then monitored the birds in the agricultural area to see if there was any sort of uh, effects. So again, caught birds in these traps. And here you can see a shrike inside of the trap. Um, after it's the, the trap door has been closed. We, we banded them, we monitored them. We then also found nests. We followed the, the birds to their nests. We then uh, took information from the babies um, and let all those, look how cute those guys are. They have their mask at a really young age. It's incredibly adorable. But they're like five days old and you can already see their little masks coming in. Um, so we, we monitored them throughout the year again and, and uh, also collected blood so we could look at, at what was going on internally. And so I'm going to kind of skip over this, but we collected blood from their brachial vein. It's the exact same vein that we use when we collect blood from humans. Um, they, they clot really rapidly. Um, and it's really, it's almost more of a problem to get enough blood than, than worry about them bleeding too much. Um, 
We also then collected poop from them. And to do that, we put them in a little box where we had some wax paper. And then there was a grate on top of that paper. They would poop. And then we'd pull out the wax paper and we would collect it. After that, we did a whole bunch of, uh, of chemical analysis. Um, over here, we use mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry to, to look at um, neonics. And then over here, we look, we did uh, genetic sampling, um, sequencing of the bacteria from the fecal samples that we collected. As I mentioned, we monitored their nests, we looked at their survival, we looked at how well they were doing, we followed the birds to see if we could find them again, just like I talked about before, but this was just during the breeding season now. And this is what we found. All right, so start out with, we're gonna start out just with prevalence, meaning did they or did they not have neonics in their blood? And the story is kind of sad, almost all of them had neonics in their blood. 80% of them, 24 out of 30 birds, had neonics in their blood during the breeding season. I guess the better news is that during the winter, none of the samples had uh, had blood, or sorry, had, none of the samples had uh, neonics, which I guess is good. So that doesn't mean that the, that means the neonics aren't persisting in the environment for a long period after, um, after they've been applied. Um, if you compare this to some other studies, uh, if you look at in Texas, there was about 36% prevalence in farmland birds in a study of tree swallows um, that came from the, I can't remember where that one's from, but they had 100%. And then a European study found 80% uh, prevalence in European honey buzzards. Uh, and so pretty close to those or, or higher in some cases. And then you can see here, we've split this off across these, these two main types of neonics. Don't worry too much about them, but one of them, the, the cloth one is is applied to certain crops. And then the imatocloprid is, is the one that is yeah, the real generalist neonic. People use it in their, their gardens. People use it on all sorts of different things. Um, and it turns out that even at the non-agricultural site, we saw a lot of imatocloprid, um, which despite the fact that there was no row crops around, there, there was still imatocloprid in the, in the system somehow. If you look at quantification, if you look at concentrations, I know this probably won't mean that much to you, but if you compare it to it, to other studies, um, the, the concentrations were pretty similar to, to Texas um, and in the UK, but they were lower than insectivores and, and granivores, which is to be expected, because I guess we are a couple of stages behind, um, maybe to be expected. What it tells you is there's probably not bioaccumulation or, or biomagnification occurring in these, in these birds. Um, it doesn't seem like it, at least. Uh, our study was a little higher than the European honey buzzards that, that we've seen so far. And so then the next step was to then look to see if the, the presence of, of neonic in the blood was related with any of the, the health metrics that we measured. And I guess the good news is there was no relationship, right? First of all, we didn't see any differences by age or sex. We didn't see any differences in reproductive success. We didn't see any pattern or relationship with body condition. We didn't see any sort of effect of return rate. All the shrikes that we sampled and monitored had 100 were successful. Every single one that we that had neonics in their system successfully raised young. They had really high return rates, 55%. And so we were unable to find any sort of pattern related to any of these measures. Now, some of the sample sizes are pretty low, but I got to say the shrikes around us seem to be doing pretty well. Now, the one caveat I will add is that one of the things that, that has been learned about neonics is that it seems like they have they can have neurological effects related to migration. And if you remember back to that data that I showed before that showed migratory individuals maybe having a lot lower survival rate than sedentary individuals, we can't rule out that there is some sort of longer term effect of these neonics possibly related to their migratory behavior. And that is something that we're thinking about potentially studying at some point in the future, but, but we're not sure yet. Um, now, the final thing I wanna show you guys, and then we'll, then we'll call it a day or a or night, and you guys can ask me some questions, is this question about microbiome. And it was really fascinating what we found so far. What we found is an incredible difference in the bacterial diversity in the gut of the shrikes that we that live in the agricultural regions. Here is the non-agricultural shrikes on the left side. Here is the agricultural shrikes on the right side. And I don't know if you've been paying attention, but this little cotton 
farmer shrike is 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 our is our agricultural shrike. Um, if you look at the diversity, what you see is there were 444, we'll, we'll call them species, but that's not the term we would technically use, but for now, just for simplistically, simplist, simpli to simplify it, we'll call them species of bacteria that were only found in agricultural shrikes. And then there were about 104 that were only found in the non-agricultural shrikes. In total, we had 827 genera, and these are genera, so I should have, shouldn't have said species, versus only 487 genera in the non-agricultural re region. If you look at the phyla, you find 31 phyla of bacteria in the agricultural areas and only 23 in the non-agricultural areas. So really fascinating what's going on here. And we don't know for sure, but I'm going to show you one really cool possible um, meaning to these results that have to do with what I was talking about before, the ability of these shrikes and their gut microbiome to detoxify some of these, these pesticides that are in the environment. So what this shows here is a whole bunch of different types of bacterial species that are found, or actually genera, that are found in these different regions. And I'm gonna point out one in particular, and that is this one right here, which is called desulfovibrionia, right? This desulfovibrionia was only found in the agricultural regions except for one individual, I think here in the, um, in the non-agricultural uh, region. And what these desulfovibronia by, by do, excuse me for not being able to pronounce these, is these are sulfate reducing and ammonia detoxifying bacteria. We don't know entirely what they do, but that's kind of the, the best guess at, their, at, at maybe what their function is and what these bacteria, how these bacteria make their living. And several of these neonics have both sulfate and ammonia um, portions to their, their chemical structure. So it could be that these bacteria are potentially helping to break down these pesticides and allow these birds in the agricultural region to do pretty well, despite the fact that they are up against you know, these, these terrible toxins that we are introducing to the environment, which we don't know if this is a evolutionary sort of process or somehow it is uh, been, um, uh, they, <laughs> excuse me, they've, they've somehow been able to incorporate that through their diet. We're, we're not entirely sure if these bacteria are there when the young are born or if they need to somehow get that bacteria into their system through eating certain things or inoculation from their parents. We're completely unsure about that also. This is all brand new. Um, this is really, I'm really excited about these data and, and we're gonna keep working on them and hopefully uh, uh, learn more about this as time goes on. So with that, um, I'm gonna kind of skip through these conclusions and We'll go straight to acknowledgments. Thanks to everyone um, that has helped in this. It's It's been a, a, a huge group effort. A ton of different people have helped. It's been an awesome, fun time. And I, and I can't wait to keep working with Shrikes as the years go on. And with that, I'll take any questions you guys have. Thanks so much, Stan. Um, I've, I've got a quick question, maybe just to start us off um, on, on that, that last bit. Yeah. I'd love, I'd love to hear, is there any thinking about the soil microbiome and its relationship? Because I'm just wondering if the agricultural fields that have been sprayed with these neonicotinoids are, uh, or neonics are, are, are responding in, in some way, like with a higher prevalence of some of these. Yeah. Um, bacteria versus the non-agricultural fields. So. Yeah, and that's a great, great question. I don't, I don't have an answer, but I think it's a, it's a good line of, of, of research next to, to see if we can figure out where these bacteria are coming from. Are these internal when they're born, when they hatch, or are they somehow getting inoculated through their diet and the soil potentially being one, you know, one of the ways that it, that it eventually gets to them? Uh, and we don't know. Yeah, we have we have no idea at this point. Um, we did want to, you know, we when we were doing a lot of this work, we we thought about um, taking environmental samples also and looking to see if we could de detect some of these neonics in the samples of of soil or water. Um, 
But we decided against that mainly for a completely practical reason, that is cost. Each one of these samples was $175 to run. Um, and so we wanted to save spend money for the birds themselves. Uh, and so we used all our money just on, on samples from the birds. It's super expensive. And the other thing that's kind of sad is there's really very few places that actually do these analyses. It took us a long time to find a lab that could do this. Um, doing it in-house was almost impossible because we didn't have any chemists that, that knew how to do this stuff. Um, and so we ended up sending it to, to University of California, Davis. Um, and since we sent our samples there, they told us that we're, they're no longer taking outside samples that aren't from the state of California to, to run any of these, these uh, analyses anymore. So now at this point, we don't have anyone that can even do the analyses that we would need done. But I, I still at some point want to do something like you are suggesting. Thanks. Hey, Thon, this is Karen Holiday. Hey. Hey, I have a question. Um, there's a spot out at the Little Walk uh, Port Authority that I have seen shrikes at for oh. several years, five, seven or more years, Some, cool. mostly one, maybe two, um, and not knowing the lifespan. Um, I'm wondering if, say, the original bird that I saw maybe seven or more years ago is has died out. Would a one of his um, offspring take over that uh, location, or will another shrike move in? Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, there's a, there's a there's a couple of possible, and I'll, I'll I'll say this: there's there's areas where where they they color band shrikes, and they go back to the same location the next year to see if that same color banded shrike is there, and there's a shrike there, and they get all excited. And they almost never see the same shrike back at that location, but there's always a shrike there, right? And so they, they and, and the, the place that I'm referring to is a, is a uh, national tall grass prairie um, in, in Illinois called Medewin. And they've been studying shrikes there for years. And they told me this story about how there's always shrikes back at the same spots, but they're never the shrikes that we had caught the year before. Mm. Um, and so your shrike that you're seeing over and over at, at that, the Port Authority, um, it, it could be the same bird. It could be an offspring of that bird, or it could be that that area for some reason is just really good for shrikes and other birds recognize it. And they, whatever is, whatever the habitat features that come together just right um, is really you know, exciting to shrikes and they, they like that area a lot. So it could be any one of those things. And it, it would be, it would, you'd need to, it would, you'd have to have the birds marked and maybe look for their nestlings or their nests also to, to really be able to answer that question. Okay. Do you have, do you know what the lifespan is? Have, has anybody figured that out? In captivity, we, we know they can live a long time, um, over 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, in the wild, uh, our birds that are over seven years old, they're some of the oldest. I think, I think the record of a wild bird, and so here's the problem. You, the only way to know exactly how old the bird is, is to either band it as a nestling, when you know that it is now just, just hatched. I know now it's, you know, two days old or catch it during its very first year of life. When you can still say that it is one year old after that, you can't age the birds anymore. And so when I said they're at least seven years old, the problem is we caught them and we called them an after second year bird because we knew they were at least one year old, but we didn't know how old they actually were. So they were something older than one year. They could have been five years. Um, so it, it's sometimes hard to get good, accurate estimates of how long these birds can live unless you band them in the nest and they stick around and you can keep watching them. The problem with that is a lot of the young birds disappear and you never see them again. And so following them for many, many years is really hard. And that's the case for lots of different species. Um, some come back to the same location, but a lot of them disperse to other areas that you have no clue where they're at. Um, so I'd say, I, I'm trying to think that, I think the record is around 10 years old, something like that in the wild, but that's probably a, a minimum, or it is a minimum for sure. I would guess that some of them can live even longer than that. And how long do mated pairs stay together and do they disperse out to their own territories? Yeah, so um, the birds that we that we band in the summer and and watch as as breeding pairs, 
Um, during the winter, a lot of times they split up and the females go somewhere else. And the males often are the ones that stick around the breeding territory. Uh, but then a lot of times the females come back and they do mate again with the same individual that they were with the previous breeding season. And so they, they kind of take a, a, some time apart from each other and then come back together. Now, that's not all the time. Sometimes there are divorces and you find new females with different males. And sometimes there are probably mates die. Uh, but the number of, of times they do stick together is, is pretty substantial. And I, I couldn't tell you exactly the percentage, but you know we've probably had 20 pairs that have bred together more than one season. Well, they're a fascinating bird. Thanks for doing the presentation on them tonight. I learned a lot. Awesome. Yeah, I love them. <laughs> yes, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Thon. And um, we, we really appreciate you sharing your research. And for sure. Look Thanks forward for having to, me. to maybe checking back in and hearing more. I would love to. Anytime. Any other questions? There's one in the chat. Oh, there is a guy. What do we got? Is there a chance of seeing any shrikes with bands in Prairie County? Um, well, there's always a chance. Uh, I don't, I don't, there's no one banding birds in Prairie County, but I will say uh, there is a whole, so I'm a part of a group called the Loggerhead Shrike Working Group. It is a international group that includes people from Mexico, Canada, um, and the United States. And a lot of different people do various little studies with shrikes that involve banding. And there have been multiple cases of birds that have been recited in places very, very far from where they were banded. Um, so there's one case of a bird that was, so by the way, loggerhead shrikes are actually, Eastern loggerhead shrikes are endangered in Canada and they're actually captively bred and released. And every single one of them is banded. Um, and someone found a uh, abandoned loggerhead shrike from Canada in North Carolina one time. And there was another one, I think, that was found in Virginia one time. And there's been other little cases of, of banded birds that have been found in places really far from when they, where they were banded. And so if you ever do see a shrike and you think you see bands on it, if you can get that band combination and you can get a, and even better get a picture of it, and we can then identify where that bird came from just by the combination of color bands that are on the leg. Um, and so you, what you'll want to do is you'll want to kind of keep track of which is their left leg and which is their right leg. Typically, they'll have four bands. They'll have two on the left leg, two on the right leg. And if you can keep track of which one's on top and which one's on bottom and which leg it's on, which can be confusing because you got to think about like which direction is that bird facing, which is left and right. Um, so if you can get a picture, that's ideal. But yeah, I mean, there's, so I won't say, I'll never say there's never a chance. It won't be very likely just because there's no one banding them there. But if you ever see one that you think there's bands on it, I would love to hear about it. And the whole group would be interested in it to, to kind of understand some of these long distance movements that we really don't have any other way of studying right now. Right. right. Okay, I've, I've got a question for you. Um, How's the reception from the uh, the local people in the area where you're studying these birds? I can honestly say that we have knocked on, I'm not sure how many doors, probably close to 100 doors. The number of people that have said, get away, we don't want, we don't want you on our property is almost zero. I have been so pleasantly surprised. Most of the time we tell people what we're doing and we're like, yeah, you, you have a nest in your, your yard and they're, and they are super excited and they want to come out and see it. They want to know what we're doing. And then they say, oh yeah, just come back anytime you want, you know, whatever, just, you know, you don't even have to knock. Just, just, I, I mean, it's been, it's been really phenomenal. The, the reception that we've had, uh, We've had a few people that, that picture of that, of that uh, snake that was, that was impaled. It, uh, <laughs> the strike carried it into the backyard of someone's house. And the front yard of this house was, I would, I would say, um, kind of intimidating. There was a, a lot of, a lot of um, garbage and it did not look like someone that would be all that interested. My own preconception was, uh, I don't think this person is gonna want me wandering around their yard. 
Um, <laughs> on their door and kind of a rough looking guy came to the door and I just said like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from Arkansas state university. I'm studying this bird. And I told him a little about it. And he looked at me, he goes, that's the most amazing thing I've heard in a long time. And he came out in the backyard and he saw this snake impaled and he was uh, as nice as could be. And I, you know, I, I kind of felt bad that I, I had a, a, a relatively negative, um, uh, expectation when I was walking up to the door, but he was super nice. And, and yeah, no, it's been, it's been pretty, it's been pretty amazing uh, how friendly everyone has been. And the, right. the number of people that are just like, yeah, come back anytime you want, you know, wander around the yard. I don't care. It's, it's been, it's been awesome. I love it. <laughs> Have you guys had any birds yet that vanished for a season and then returned after, after being missed? Jacob Wessels. So I don't know if you guys noticed that uh, Jacob was one of the grad students that was a part of this this work. Um, okay. He was he did his master's degree at Arkansas State and he studied cerulean warblers in in the Buffalo River. Um, but in the winter he helped out with this project. So uh, hi Jacob, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing all right. Um, I think we finally got one last winter. I got to talk to M. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure we have one now. And so Jacob's asking if if we ever have a bird that we didn't see one winter, or sorry, we caught, we saw one winter, didn't see one winter, and then saw it a, a winter afterwards. I think last year we got our first, which is, I was always expecting more of them. Um, and, and the reason that this, this question is, is of importance is what this tells you is something about um, whether or not birds are actually dead or dispersed and you just miss them because they went somewhere else. Because if you get birds that you didn't see one winter, but then you see the next winter, obviously they were alive that previous winter, they just weren't around or you just missed them somehow, which means that your ability to detect them is lower than 100%. It means that you're missing some of them out there, which means that your estimates of survival are actually lower than, the, than reality because you're not able to detect them all the time. But Overall, there haven't been very many. It's a, it's a very small number. I, I think we have one now. And I think we have one from the breeding season also uh, now where we had it one breeding season, didn't have it the next, and then it, then it showed up again the one afterwards. And I, I have to ask M, one of my other grad students, uh, but I, I think they were pretty far apart, the, loca the locations where we saw them the second time. It wasn't like they came back to the exact same location. It was one of the ones that dispersed a little bit farther between years. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, this is great. Well, again, Don, thank you so much for, for sharing your research. And <laughs> thank you all for, for joining us for the uh, presentation. I know that next month's ASCA meeting will be a potluck at the Audubon Center, one o'clock on December 2nd. So mark your calendars for that. And uh, again, thank you, Thon, and look forward to seeing how your research progresses. You're very welcome. It's a lot of fun. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.